it's not very often we learn useful moral lessons from thieves. But we hope to do just that today. In verse 32 of Luke 23, there were two men who shared the crucifixion at Golgotha with our Lord Jesus Christ. And between the two of them, they can teach us great lessons about the response to suffering. Because these two thieves very graphically illustrate the difference in human reaction to the curse of mortality that has dominated human experience since the Garden of Eden. Understanding mortality and suffering has always presented one of the greatest challenges to believers and unbelievers alike. We go back to Solomon and look at Solomon's conclusions about life. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. And Solomon concluded that for all of our occasional joys, our immortal life, our mortal life is ultimately vanity and vexation of spirit. For both rich and poor alike, all are of the dust and all return to the dust. And it's only those who are spiritually attuned to the mind of God that can comprehend our God has a much larger and eternal purpose in the sufferings and the curse that we endure. It's not just about God giving us personal happiness in this life. You know these very familiar words from the Apostle Paul in Romans 8. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. The earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. And God has subjected the creation to futility, not willingly, not without any reason or purpose, but by reason of him who subjected it in hope. The creation shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption to the glorious liberty of the children of God. And we understand the mind of God as to why suffering and mortality and curse are with us in the world today. We can see it's all part of God's master plan, and in our case, part of the chastening he does for those that he loves as his children. We can understand why it's through much tribulation that we enter the kingdom of God. People in the world, they look at natural disasters, many people being died, dying in tsunamis and things like that. They look at the wars that happen. They look at disability and they say, well, how can God, how can a loving God be out there if this is happening in our world and in the western world unfortunately they've been sold the false god of my right to personal happiness and it usually comes with material things but it's not like that is it but we who believe that there is a god we who believe that god has a plan and a purpose we can also have our faith severely damaged by sudden adversity just like job's family did Think of Job's wife. She got to a point she was tempted to curse God and to die. Very understandable when you've lost your whole life's work in those ten children. You see, it can happen to the best of people. And nothing challenges our faith like severe injustice or unexplained tragedy. And you can think of many tragedies we've endured over the years. Unexpected tragedies. You know, sometimes as believers, we can think that God will share us with blessings because we believe. And yet God tells us the opposite is, opposite is generally true. That every branch that brings forth good fruit will be pruned by the Father to generate more fruit. And so we grapple with the reality of our present sufferings. And that's why the Bible is full of examples for us to go to. We have the story of Joseph's early life with all the injustice involved in that. We have Job's journey of suffering through false accusations being made against him. We have Jeremiah's lamentations for what he endured. We have so many sad and depressive psalms where men of God poured out to God their, their frustrations at what was happening to them. And we have Solomon's conclusions in Ecclesiastes, all to instruct us that God is trying to inspire hope and for us to be looking at the future and not to attach ourselves too firmly to this life. But for us who are called the saints of God, there's more than just sharing mortality with seven billion others. In the truth, we have high aspirations for ourselves, for our families, 
and for our brethren and sisters. And sometimes in those areas we are disappointed and frustrated. And when it comes to mortality itself, we know so many people, some of us know people all over the world, and we know in our community how quickly bad news travels. And we're frequently saddened by news of illness and death and personal failure that happens to our brethren and sisters. And it's easy to sit back and to question, where is God in all this? And we want to talk this morning about how we react when tragedy, disappointment and frustration crosses our path. Because we have to see it as God wants us to see it. You know, Paul tells us that trial is only beneficial to those who are exercised thereby. We have to learn from whatever happens, whatever God allows to happen or brings to pass in our life, we have to learn to be exercised by it, that we might grow spiritually and improve ourselves through that suffering that one day we might attain to glory. We all know the theory of suffering before glory, but we don't like it when it actually comes across our path. And so today we're going to look at two men who react very differently to their sufferings. We're going to see the right and the wrong way to the suffering that they were enduring. Now it was written that the Messiah would be numbered with the transgressors. That was in Isaiah 53. So God saw to it that on this day there were two others that would die in the same way, one on the right and one on the left. And in one of them, God would mercifully provide for the Lord Jesus Christ the first fruits of his suffering. And we can learn so much from this unnamed man who has an amazing place in God's plan. He could say like no other person could ever say, I am crucified with Christ, and so he was. He was literally crucified, as no person could ever be. And he was there to show the Lord, before the Lord died, that his sacrifice would not be in vain. He would see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. He saw it that day in this man's conversion. I want you to come first to Matthew 27 because we need to pick up some extra details from Matthew before we come back to Luke 23. Now the process of crucifixion is well understood by us. We've often described with all the gruesomeness what it was like to be crucified. They would have the patibulum, the crossbar. They would lay it on the ground, stretch out your arms, and then they would nail through, probably through the wrist, just below the hand. They would nail through there, enormous, huge nails. And then they would take that patibulum and put it upon the post that was already in the ground. And we know the, 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 the terrible process this was and the pain that it caused, the agony of severed and crushed nerves in your arm, the difficulty breathing once you were hung up there, where you had to push up on the, on the nail they then put through your feet and they would twist your body sideways to make it more painful. And then you'd push up on that nail through your ankles to push yourself up so you could breathe. And the open shame that came, and a body goes into shock like those bodies did. The physical collapse that ensures you lose control of your bodily functions. It was rightly described as the cruelest, most shameful, and the most agonizingly slow death the sadistic and cruel minds could devise. Crucifixion was not a pleasant thing. And as these three men were nailed to their crossbars, and then later on had their feet nailed to the, the upright post, their nerves were severed, and the shock and the pain hit them like a wave. And agony found voice. Look at verse 44 of Matthew 27. And the thieves also which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. So everybody is, is raging in anger, except Christ. Agony found voice and they screamed out, and they noticed this, they screamed out against Christ. And at the same time, by contrast, Jesus is praying over and over for the Roman soldiers. When you go into the Greek of what Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they know what they do. It's actually in the continuous sense Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. He had to keep saying it to himself. They were just soldiers doing their job. And he prayed for them while the agony of those nails was going through and the nerves were jangling up and down his arms. But I want you to notice what it says. 
the other two weren't screaming at the Romans. They were railing on Jesus. And they went on doing this for some time. From either side of the cross, they kept railing on Jesus. Not against the Romans. Have you ever wondered why they both turned on him? He hadn't committed their crimes. He hadn't built the nails through their hands and feet. Why were they turning on him? And for the first three hours, they repeated the derision and the scorn of the crowd and the priests that were being thrown against Jesus. Why would they do that? We'll come back to Luke 23 and we get the answer there. So in Luke 23, we actually have the reason why they railed against Jesus and not the Romans. Now, going through the record, Jesus in verse 34, there it's in that, that's the continuous Greek. He's repeating it over and over. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. He's repeating that. That's the way he's coping with the pain and the shame. The people in verse 35, the rulers are deriding him. Let him save himself. And this, this idea of saving himself comes up from the priests, from the soldiers, and from the thieves. Because they all knew that he had the power to do it. They all knew that Jesus could perform miracles. He'd walk through crowds of hostile people trying to stone him or throw him over cliffs. He just walked away from them in past times. They'd seen him do incredible miracles, calming the waves, feeding the 5,000, healing people by the thousands. And so they're saying, save yourself, save yourself. The soldiers in the same thing, saying, save yourself. Then we come down to the thieves in verse 39. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. And now we get to the motive. This is why both of them, for the first couple of hours, cried against Jesus and not the Romans. Because they knew he had the power. They knew that he could do miracles. Nicodemus said, everybody knows that you must be from God because of the miracles you do. Why don't you intervene? Now the word there in verse 39 is a very strong word. When it says they railed on him, the word is blasphemo in the Greek. They blasphemed him. They threw every insult they could to try and provoke him to do something about their plight. And they hated him because he wasn't using the power that they knew he had to deliver himself. But there's a very critical difference in verse 40 from what you read in the other records. And it says this, but the other. And one of them stopped to sink. And he stopped cursing Jesus and he started to sink. The other. So we have a separation now between the two thieves that takes place. Up until this point, they've both been rebuking Jesus for not saving them and himself. And one of them starts to think. Quite amazing, isn't it? And the separation is quite critical. Look what he says in verse, 30, in verse 40. But the other, so now there's a separation of thought between the two thieves, rebuked the other thief. And you can imagine this conversation is going across from one, one, one crucifixion over here, across Jesus to the other one over there. You know, when you can hardly breathe, it's very hard to get words out. I mean, you get the idea that Jesus was gasping most of the time when he spoke those seven sayings from the cross. Very hard. You would have push up, say something, and then drop down again. But this conversation took place across Jesus between the two thieves. And one of them rebukes the other. And, and unexpected support came to Jesus. Look what he said in verse 40. You know, he was the only person in the whole crucifixion process to publicly declare that Jesus was innocent. On this day, every human being that was there was either silent or declaring that Jesus was, a, was deserving to die. One man, one man said Jesus was innocent. The disciples were nowhere. John was looking after Mary. The women stood afar off. Only after Jesus died did the centurion say this was the Son of God. 
There was only one voice of support for the whole day that Jesus had, and it came from this man. This man has done nothing worthy of death. And it was a day when the crowds were questioning his father's love. He said, the son of God will let God deliver you. There was hatred, there was verbal abuse, there were taunts, there were questioning of his father's love. You imagine how, how, how much it meant to a thirsty soul to hear words of vindication and faith from this man. And so he silenced his fellow thief. And he said in verse 41, We indeed died justly. We received the due reward for our deeds. We're dying for our sins. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he silences the other thief. And then he turns to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. We're going to look at the beautiful reply that Jesus gave in just a moment. It's very sad, isn't it, that we often look at this record of the thief on the cross, usually from a doctrinal perspective, and we're arguing with people in the church who believe in immediate transition to heaven, or believing in deathbed repentance. We often have to contend with that when we deal with doctrine. But this is a passage where you have the last individual that Christ actually have a conversation with, saying that Jesus alone is righteous and all men deserve to die. I want you to look at this today as an amazing statement of this man's faith. Its content is quite surprising when you put it down, what this man actually believed in the, the short record we have. He had an amazing concept of Jesus' work, his character, and his future. And that was not gained while he was hanging on the cross. Up to this point, the only words he'd heard Jesus say that day were, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. All the other sayings of Jesus are after this. So where did he learn all of this truth on that day? Well, obviously not on that day. He must have known these things for some time. His reference to the kingdom had not come that day. You know, we're told early in the Gospels that Jesus went everywhere preaching the kingdom of God. He went from city to city preaching the kingdom of God. And this man had heard that gospel and had believed it. When he said, when you come into your kingdom, applies an arrival or coming again. He understood the resurrection of Christ. He understood the second coming. He understood the process of judgment. Remember me, there would be a sorting out at that time. He had a great concept of the future, of the purpose and plan of God. He was miles ahead of the disciples. They'd been sitting at Jesus' feet for three years and still couldn't work out the purpose of the cross, still couldn't work out the idea of resurrection. They would need 40 more days of intense instruction to fully comprehend the kingdom of God. How often do we read that when Jesus was very specific about his resurrection, Mark 9.32, they understood not that saying. Luke 18.34, they understood none of these things. Luke 24, fools and slow of heart to believe. They just didn't get it. This man had got it. He had worked it out. He worked out what the death of Christ was about. It was about the future kingdom. Here's a man that has got a very deep faith. He's probably the only man in the world outside Christ that understood the cross before the crown, suffering before glory. And he believed he could be forgiven of all of his sins and get life eternal. Roman justice wouldn't forgive him. It would exact its final horrible retribution. But he appealed to Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom. He understood you could be saved by faith and by grace. He's a man without works. What can he offer by way of works? Well, here he was, believing in the kingdom. He had a fear of God. He said to his fellow thief, don't you fear God? Don't you see that this is your last chance to get yourself right with God before you die? He knew that God was at work here and that God should be feared. 
It's really sad, isn't it, when people make the opposite conclusion about tragedy and suffering. I was greatly moved at the Washington Holocaust Museum, which is almost a, an incredible thing to see because they've got all of the things from Auschwitz there. And you come out emotionally moved. And as you come out, you're faced with a, a great big column. And on, on this column is a quote from a Jewish diary that was found hidden at Auschwitz. And some Jew had written this in his diary. When I entered Auschwitz, I stopped believing in God. <laughs> See, that's a bad reaction to tragedy and suffering, isn't it? That's saying that God has to sort out everything in this life. That's got no vision for the future. And you can react to suffering like that and saying, well, if God's let this happen in my life, I'm not going to believe in him anymore. That's the bad reaction. That's what the other thief had done. He wasn't fearing God anymore. He was railing against Jesus. But this thief, the one that we're looking at this morning, he not only declared God's righteousness, that God alone is right and all sinners are worthy to die, but he testified to the innocence of Jesus. And he no longer encouraged Jesus to save himself now, as the other had continued to do. This man now accepts that death is inevitable and he's focused on the future. Now let's just think about where did this tremendous grasp of the truth come from in this man? As we said, it could not have been learnt that day. Well, I'm going to suggest a possibility. The word thief or malefactor we have here is, is very misleading. It means a criminal. They were not pickpockets. They were not swindlers. They were not burglars. These two men, and if Jesus hadn't been put in the place of Barabbas, there would have been three of these men being crucified that day. These men were what would be called by the Jews freedom fighters. And by the Romans, they would call them terrorists. So here are people who have got political motivations who resort to violence to fulfill them. If they're on our side, they're freedom fighters. They're on the other side, they're terrorists. They were Jewish patriots fighting the Roman occupation. That's why they were being crucified by the Romans. Barabbas had been the leader of the gang, but he got off and Jesus took his place. Now come to John chapter 6. I want to show you where I think this man came from. Andy. In John chapter 6, we have the, the great miracle of the feeding of the multitude. Andy. An incredible miracle that no man could deny. You know, the the, the, the bread just keep going out and going out and going out and they gather up all the baskets at the end of it. And it says in verse 13 of John chapter 6, Therefore they gathered together 12 baskets of fragments and five barley loaves, of the five barley loaves. So there's the, there's the physical evidence at the end of the feeding that this has been an incredible miracle. 12 huge baskets. And then it says this in verse 14, Then these men. Now what men are we talking about here? There are people watching this. This is not the crowd that have just been fed. There are people watching this miracle with great interest. These men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, Aha, this is the great prophet that Moses talked about. Here's somebody come that we've been waiting for to help us defeat the Romans. So look what they're going to do in verse 15. Jesus perceived that they, that is these men that have been watching this, that they would come and take him by force. Now, that's almost anomalous, isn't it? If you've got a man that can work miracles and you're going to try and tie him up and take him away. But that's what freedom fighters, they, they only have one thing in mind. We want action and we want it now. They're going to take him by force and make him a king and they're going to use his power to get rid of the Romans. That's what they wanted to do. These men were impressed by the miracle. Here's the man to defeat the Romans. We're going to make him our king. And Jesus understands this is going on in their heads. So what does he do? He gives them John chapter 6. The speech of John 6 then happens. And this is an amazing speech. You know, these men, they were called zealots. Fanatical, violent Jewish nationalists. They lived by violence, by plunder, robbing people on the roads, and particularly robbing Roman supply depots. That's why the Romans were crucifying them. But just look at what's going on here. They want to take him by force. Now look what Jesus says. I want you to just 
We can't go through the whole speech, but I want to just notice one thing about this speech. Jesus focuses on the last day. So let's just pick it up in verse 39. John chapter 6, verse 39. He says there, at the end of verse 39, I will raise him up at the last day. The end of verse 40, I will raise him up at the last day. The end of verse 44, I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 47, everlasting life, not this life, everlasting life. The end of verse 50, that's what the end of verse 54, I will raise him up at the last day. So when you go through those verses, it's very, very obvious, isn't it? that Jesus is talking about a resurrection at the end of time. And Jesus says in verse 87, He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So Jesus is saying, look, don't focus on trying to get rid of the Romans. It's not about the Romans. What we need to focus on is the last day, the resurrection. That's the end of God's purpose. That's where you want to be at the end of time. And he ends up this speech by talking about people eating his flesh and drinking his blood, which immediately turned off many Jews. Look what happens at the end of John chapter 6. Remember, he's talking because of the zealots' attitude of trying to make him their king. So we come down to the end of John 6, and we know what happened. Many left him. Verse 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. You know, some of these people had been following Jesus for two and a half years. And now they turn on it, turn their backs and walk away because he won't take on the Romans. He won't use his power to defeat Rome. They know the truth. They've been listening to the gospel of the kingdom. But they want action now. And they walk away. And Jesus said to the twelve, are you going to go also? Now in that twelve, there was Simon Zelotes, Simon the Zealot. What a temptation for him to go. When they were sent out two by two, he was partnered with Judas Iscariot. And Peter's response was, Lord, we won't go. Where else will we go? And Jesus then says, and for the first time, for the very first time, Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. Because he knows that probably in the heart of Judas, who was probably thinking like a zealot, He's now realized that the kingdom is not going to happen now. Jesus says, one of you is a devil. And he spoke of Simon, but it's Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, who should betray him. And for the first time, Jesus says, it's going to be a betrayer. And he's saying this as the zealots walk away. Isn't that interesting? I believe where this man came from, that he was one of those zealots that walked away that day, ended up being captured by the Romans for the plunder they took upon the Roman supplies and was being crucified with Barabbas, his leader, that day. And now, here he is with Jesus on the cross. You know, that shows you why this man could be saved. He actually had believed the gospel. He had faith, but it had lapsed. The Bible doesn't encourage last-minute conversions from people who've ignored God all their life As they're about to die, as the church would do, saying, well, we'll give you the sacraments and you can go to heaven. No, it doesn't work like that. He's an educated believer that's gone wrong through political involvement, now realising the great mistake he's made in thinking it was about conquering the Romans when really it's about conquering our human nature. And he had to learn that lesson. It wasn't about conquering the Romans. It is always possible for the disciples of Christ to repent and to return, even at the 11th hour, that God might finish the work that he started in us. Let me just deal quickly with the doctrinal issues that come out of this section in Luke 23. Just go back to Luke 23. There are some doctrinal issues we need just to mention. Was the thief baptised? Well, probably was, baptised in the baptism of John, um, may have been baptised earlier, but, of course, baptism was not required at this point. He could have been baptised by John, Jesus, or the disciples. But Jesus was not yet dead. He was not yet raised. So baptism into Christ as we know it was not required nor possible. And anyway, what is baptism but identification with the death of Christ symbolically? 
Do you think this man needed some way to identify with the death of Christ? He was crucified with Christ. He was there. He shared it in the way that James and John didn't have the courage to share it. He was there at the crucifixion. So he didn't need to be baptised. When you come to this little phrase, which is so misquoted in verse 43, I say unto thee, comma, today you shall be with me in paradise. The punctuation is clearly wrong. Check it from the diaglot, Rotherham, any good literal translation, the punctuation is moved. What it should be was, I say unto you today, you shall be with me in paradise. You can check that out. You see the same idiom in the Hebrew, in Hebrews 3, verse 15, Acts 20, verse 26. I say unto you today. So Jesus is saying, you have asked me to remember you when I come into the kingdom. But if I don't give you a positive response, you will die not knowing that you've received the grace of God. I'm telling you now, you won't die in uncertainty. You're going to be in the kingdom. I tell you today, you will be there. Your salvation is sure. Well, it wasn't heaven going anyway, was it? Because Jesus was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Can't be immediate transition to heaven. That's just a doctrinal sign. But why paradise? You know, the choice of the word that Jesus uses was an unusual response. Paradisos, the garden of God. You will be with me in the garden of God. Now, I believe at this particular point, the Lord was coping with the pain and the shame that he was experiencing by mentally going over all the scriptures concerning himself and why there needed to be such a painful, shameful sacrifice. We're told in Hebrews 12 that Jesus survived the pain and the shame by thinking against the shame. He thought against the shame. How do you do that? Well, he was going back to the Garden of Eden. He was reliving the events of the garden. He was thinking about the way of the tree of life when he's hanging on a tree of death. He's thinking about the lamb that God would provide, that there had to be someone die to save others from their sins. And he was thinking about Eden restored. And that's Bible language for the restoration of the glories of the divine creation, of man and nature being in harmony, of man having fellowship with the Elohim. Imagine what it was like for Adam and Eve to hear the angels sing at the end of the day, to walk and talk with the Elohim with no sense of fear, to live without toil and without curse in the beauty of the creation that they inherited. And Jesus' mind is back there. We have to get back to that point. We've got to get back to the garden of God. And he says to this man, you will be with me in paradise. You know, it says in, in Isaiah 51 that God will make the land of Israel like the Garden of Eden. It will be a microcosm of beauty for the whole world to see what can be achieved if you serve God properly. You'll be with me in paradise, he said to this man. And Jesus used the garden as part of his reply. What a contrast that was. You know, here was a lonely hillside, very likely the edge of a cliff, the place of a skull. Three dying men writhing in pain, scraps of human flesh on dead trees, amid wild beasts more wild and dangerous than hyenas or lions. The place of a skull. And Jesus' mind is thinking against the shame. He's thinking about the garden of God and the restoration of Eden upon the earth. What a contrast to the awful sacrifice that was going on. And besides what he said to John about looking after his mother, these were the last words he spoke to any man directly. He promised the thief that he would have eternal life. And then darkness fell for three hours. At 3 p.m., Jesus finally died. He gave up the spirit. He didn't bother to breathe anymore. And for the next three hours, from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., this lonely man, the first to be crucified with Christ, had another three hours of agony to endure. But you can imagine the hope that was now mingled with the pain. He said to me, I will be in the garden of God. 
and as the day began to close, the Romans broke his legs and he choked to death. His body was probably burnt in Gehenna. But in this man, Jesus saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. He knew that his death was achieving something, and this man had been the first fruits in his death. I often wonder where this man will be in the kingdom of God. Maybe very close to the Lord Jesus Christ for much of the time. Perhaps even one of those places that John and James sought to have on the right and the left, and who couldn't face up to the cross. Wherever he will be, brethren and sisters, it's going to be a great pleasure to meet him. But I want to think about what was it that changed him from a blasphemer to a repentant saint in that last hour? How can you go from being so critical and so abusive to suddenly changing like that? There are lots of things we can learn from this man and his sudden change. And these are the things that he can teach us. We have to give up on this life as an end in itself. Now, when we're young and we're accumulating and, and try to build up whatever it is we have in this life, this life has very much the process of an end in itself. But as we get older and some of our friends are gone and we realize that our physical faculties are declining, it's easier to focus, isn't it, on the future. But all of us have to learn to give up on this life as an end in itself. Sometimes it's very happy. But this existence is about getting ready for the eternal that is put before us. We have to accept the fate of mortality. We have all sinned and are worthy of death sooner or later. And the first base of our spiritual rebirth like this man is to realize that we are worthy, all of us, we are worthy of death. And the other thing we have to learn to do is to stop blaming other people. We die justly. And when we understand that all the things that God allows to happen or even brings upon us are designed to improve us for the kingdom, we can begin to grow spiritually. It's so easy to go through life saying, well, I can't do this because they did that. Got to stop blaming others. They were saying to Jesus, you've got to save us. Well, no, it wasn't about that. And he uncoupled his pain and his shame from any perception of unfairness. You know, we have a great sensitivity to things that are unfair or unjust. But this man detached it. It's not. He said, look, I'm dying because I did crimes. I'm dying because I'm a sinner. And he attached his brain power to the future. And you have to detach ourselves from any perception that this life is unfair but to focus on what God is trying to achieve by getting us to think about hope. We can't audit God. We can't question God. We've got to say that whatever God allows to happen in our lives can be used for our ultimate good. Remember what Job said to his wife? Shall we receive only good at the hand of God? Shall we not also receive evil? And that's how a loving father deals with us. Sometimes God has a hand in human suffering. Think of the man born blind, which Jesus said to his disciples. His affliction was that the work of God might be made manifest. Think of Lazarus and his grief-stricken sisters. He was allowed to die that the glory of God might be shown. So sometimes God has a purpose in the suffering that he brings upon his disciples. Look at the lives of the great Bible characters, Abraham and Joseph and Jeremiah and Paul and Moses, and see their times of travail and suffering and, and family problems they had. All of these things, God says, are opportunities for growth in the faith in the things to come. We need to believe a faith that believes God knows what he's doing has a far longer and a far wider view than we sometimes do. We serve a very big God with a very fantastic purpose for those that he's called to be his disciples in this mortal life. We have to accept that all flesh is grass. 
that sometimes others will disappoint us as we disappoint God. But let us use adversity as a means to focus on the joys to come and be determined to find that benefit from whatever happens in our lives and realize that God may not arrange our comforts. He may rather improve us through carefully selected afflictions. One of the great benefits of suffering is the ability that is gained to sympathize and empathize with others going through similar situations. There are things sometimes you cannot understand until you've traversed the valley of the shadow yourself. But once you have, you should be far more sensitive and therefore far more relevant to other people. I always remember a case that happened years ago where a child was born with a serious disability. As the word got around, a sister who had been through the same thing with her child dropped everything, rushed to the hospital and threw her arms around the mother. It always struck me as a tremendous example of empathy from somebody who knew what they were going to have to go through in that family. And that's one of the great benefits of suffering. We become better at empathy and sympathy with people who are suffering similar things. So we can learn much, can't we, today from this unnamed criminal. A man we hope to meet very soon and to really learn his whole story from himself. And hopefully we can thank him for teaching us how to, to react correctly when adversity comes our way. So let us, as we take these eminence, brethren and sisters, say with him today, Should thy wisdom, Lord, decree trials long and sharp for me, pain or sorrow, care or shame, Father, glorify thy name. Lord, remember us when thou comest into thy kingdom. <laughs>